helping to put this event tonight together with our moderator, Hani Maleki, who we all know as a very talented musician in our community, and Assemblyman David Weprin, who is running for New York City Comptroller. He's currently an Assemblyman for the 25th District in Queens. So um, for the duration of this conversation, we're going to mute everybody and their videos. So just please bear in mind as we go through the evening, and I will turn it over now to Hani, who will be our moderator and our speaker for the night. Hani, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you, Avi. Uh, well, when Avi reached out to me a couple of days ago, or about a week and a half ago or so, and he asked me to be involved, my immediate reaction was, get out of here. This is not for me. I don't care about this. I don't, I don't want to be involved. Um, but Avi is not a, a person who takes no for an answer. He put a lot of pressure on me. And I said, you know what? Send me some information and I'll get back to you. So he sent me the information and I didn't have time to look it up. To, to look at it. So I just said, you know, Avi, you know, I told you I'd get back to you. I didn't. So I'm going to do it. And let's just hope for the best. And I think it's important to know why I didn't want to do it. The reason I didn't want to be involved in this is because I've never voted in, a, in an election before, except for this last one. And the only reason I did that is because I could do it mail-in from the safety of my home. I just never felt that uh, it was important enough to, uh, to vote in an election. Now, I know a lot of people say straight away that, hey, what do you mean election is democracy? I, I'm just telling you uh, why it's just not important to me. I, I just, I'm not a voter. Uh, on top of that, I'd never heard of a controller before. So this afternoon, I did a little bit of research. I, I looked it up and, uh, and Avi sent me some information. I, so I have a basic idea of what a controller is all about, but I still don't know exactly what it is. And I don't know why it's important. So we have a couple of things that we're going to try to do today. Number one, we're going to try to answer the basic questions of what is a controller? Why is it important? And then we're going to try to, at the same time, we want to try to get to know uh, David Weprin, Mr. David Weprin, who I believe is uh, in the middle of a campaign to become the, the next controller of New York City and find out if and why he would be the man to do that. So uh, firstly, Welcome, Mr. Weprin. Should I call you David or how do we? David's fine. Yeah. So, so first of all, welcome and thank you for making the time to, uh, to educate our community and to tell us about yourself. Um, before we start with the questions, I'd just like to know a little bit about you. So I've noticed the yarmulke on your head. Um, so I know that you are either Jewish or you're uh, pretending to be Jewish. <laughs> so uh, I looked up on your, uh, on your uh, website. I see that you have a very diverse background. Your mother is Cuban uh, American. Your father's here from Brooklyn. So we'd like to first to hear, because this is a Jewish community, we'd like to hear about uh, you in terms of your Jewishness and how you uh, identify with the Jewish community and how your Jewishness informs the way you uh, run your lives and, and your politics. Oh, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I'm a product of the yeshiva system. Um, so, uh, you know, I went, I, I went to yeshiva, uh, yeshiva of Central Queens, uh, yeshiva high school of Queens uh, for a while. Then I went to, um, uh, I, I switched actually um, to uh, Jamaica High School where I graduated uh, from, but I also went to yeshiva on the side when I was at uh, Jamaica High School. And then I went to uh, SUNY Albany, State University of New York at Albany. Uh, and uh, Hofstra Law School. But, um, you know, I've always been a uh, committed Jew. I'm, uh, I'm Shomer Shabbos. Uh, I belong to uh, two young Israels. You can't be a politician and belong to one shul. So, uh, and I'm active in both of those young Israels, the uh, young Israel of Jamaica States and the young Israel of Holliswood, which is actually the, uh, the area that I grew up in. Uh, I've lived in uh, the Jamaica States Holliswood area uh, my entire life. Uh, I actually... Um, was uh, made up the original minion uh, at the Young Israel Jamaica States. They had a house uh, then before they built the shul. Uh, there were there were a number of um, conservative synagogues in the area. Um, uh, my, my parents, uh, you know, grew up. Uh, well, my mother grew up uh, in an Orthodox family, but my uh, father, uh, you know, was was involved with the conservative uh, conservative shul. Uh, but I. Um, since my bar mitzvah wanted to only go to an Orthodox shul. So I, I used to walk uh, about two miles uh, from our house in, uh, in Jamaica States to uh, uh, the Young Israel of Hillcrest, which was the neighboring 
uh, young Israel uh, with a you know larger uh, Orthodox community. And then I was actually part of the original minion to start the Young Israel Jamaican States. Uh, I was actually bar mitzvahed at uh, uh, Hollisswood Jewish Center, which became the Young Israel. It was it was always a traditional uh, shul, but it wasn't uh, you know it didn't have a full machitza. It had a men's section, a women's section, and, and a co-ed section. Uh, but then it eventually uh, transitioned uh, to having a machitza and, and becoming uh, an Orthodox shul. And that's actually the same shul that I belong to now, uh, along with uh, the Young Israel Jamaican States, where I was a uh, part of the original minion uh, that formed it uh, in the house. They used to actually invite, uh, you know, different bachrim to sleep over to uh, to make the minion. So uh, it's it's got a long history and it's it, it's been in my area and I've been involved. I've also been involved with Chabad uh, for many years. Uh, when I went to college at SUNY Albany, I, I was very involved uh, with the uh, the Rubens, the Chabad rabbi, uh, uh, Rabbi uh, Israel Rubin uh, in Albany, uh, and I uh, helped him out a lot. And they started the Shabbos house, and um, and we did a lot of activities for uh, Yom Tovim for Shabbos. We had services, uh, you know, um, you know, on on the campus. So I, I've been involved with Chabad uh, for many years, and uh, I became a, a board member uh, for the National Committee for the Furtherance of Jewish Education. Uh, you know, the Hex. Uh, Group and was involved uh, with a lot of um, you know education with uh, you know summer camps and uh, release time for public school system public school kids uh, you know I was very involved with Rabbi J J Hecht Oliver uh, Shalom uh, and uh, and a lot of his activities uh, and um, I've you know been involved uh, with the Chabad community for many years I I actually have two active Chabads in my assembly district uh, one at uh, Rabbi uh, Yerach Mil Zalmanov in uh, Hollis Hills uh, and Rabbi Yossi Blasovsky uh, in Bayside. Uh, and I actually, when I was chair of the finance committee of the city council, uh, I kind of got, uh, you know, the Chabad in, uh, in Bayside started, uh, you know, with, with Rabbi Blasovsky. We actually did a capital project uh, for, from the city uh, for them. And it was one of the few, we had to go through a lot of hoops because, you know, you have separation of church and state and, you uh, it became a community center, was separate from the uh, from the actual shul and, and the services, but it's become a community center, a school, uh, and I was very involved uh, in that uh, early on. But uh, I'm really I'm happy I asked you that because because going in, I I, I I mean I knew that you must be at least Jewish, uh, uh, but I didn't know that you're Shema Shabbos or you see I just learned that now myself. So that's actually very interesting. So it means that you know a little bit about the needs of the. Uh, of the Jewish community. And now I know that if you are- And all my, all my kids went to yeshiva too. They went to different yeshivas, but uh, you know, I, uh, I supp- it's funny uh, as a, an elected official, a city councilman, I served in the city council for eight years where I chaired the finance committee and I've been in the assembly now uh, for 11 and a half years. And I'm a strong supporter of the public school system, but that's not inconsistent uh, with supporting uh, the yeshiva system. And I've been actually uh, fighting uh, against the Department of Education uh, interference uh, on the uh, equivalency issue, because um, you know uh, religious education and yeshiva education uh, is um, is very um, you know uh, educational from a secular point of view as well as a religious point of view, and uh, I don't think uh, a lot of the educators realize you know how how much. You learn, uh, and and the you know the method of learning uh, that you experience is is more than a substantial equivalent with the secular education. It's it's certainly beyond that. Uh, you know the whole Socrate, you know Socrate, uh, method. Uh, it's it's almost like a legal, uh, you know, way of going to law school. You know, learning, uh, you know, uh, you know, Chumash and uh, Gemara, and uh, it's. Uh, it's it's really, I've been so I've been fighting uh, with the uh, a group called Pearls, which are like a coalition of uh, you know yeshiva educators uh, to say that uh, there shouldn't be you know interference uh, in the religious school system because there you know there were a couple of uh, people you may be familiar with that were former you know uh, involved with the Hasidic schools and then they uh, you know they started their own you know uh, kind of protest and they're saying that uh, they don't teach. You know, English. Right, the or, Yafet or Society, yes. Right, y- right. Yafet. Yafet. 
uh, and uh, I've been kind of fighting them because uh, you know I I know a little better. There's no look. There's always individual individuals that you know are affected negatively yeah. uh, by by any school yeah. system, and uh, and there's certainly you know some yeshivas that are better than others as far as secular education. But you you have to look at the the overall learning process uh, overall, and uh, and certainly you know the, um, the what you learn uh, in the yeshivas. Uh, is you know is beyond uh, you know an equivalent. I think it's it, it's it's more than that. So, but I but we have religious freedom, and I've been fighting for religious freedom legislatively. Uh, and I have a very diverse uh, district now, assembly district. We have um, uh, I, in Queens. We let have let me interrupt you if you don't mind, sure, because I think we're I think we're jumping the gun. Yes. Um, and I and I, I would love to circle back to all of this because. Now that I know that you, you're a Shomer Shabbos person and that you're familiar with the community, that means you're familiar with the needs of the community. I think that you might even be more helpful in asking and telling us what you think the issues are than in me us, you know, trying to come up with issues to present to you. But let's get back to that, because the reason that we're here today is to uh, is to determine if we want to vote for you as the uh, controller. And as I said before, if it's even worth the time for me to leave my house to vote at all. So let's start from there, because once we understand what the controller is, and once we understand why and if it's worth uh, if it, it, having an opinion about, then we can start, I think, moving more into the issues and, and, and how a controller uh, affects or cannot affect those issues. So uh, based on my very, very limited um, uh, research this afternoon, a controller to me seems to be an accountant. Uh, you haven't, every business has an accountant. Small businesses, you might do it on your own, but something like the, uh, the government, uh, where you have billions of dollars of, uh, of money going through and hundreds of thousands of employees in the case of, of a city like, uh, like New York. So you need an accountant with a big staff who runs the whole thing. Now, so it seems to me that a controller is just an accountant um, who basically says, okay, this is how much money we have, make sure that the, the money is invested well, make sure that, the, that money isn't wasted and that there's no uh, corruption, et cetera. Uh, is that all it is? Uh, because if it is, why does it matter who it is? We just need somebody competent. Uh, what, so my question is, what is a controller and why does it matter? As long as we have a person who's competent and not corrupt, why, why does it matter who the controller is? Yeah, well, first of all, it's not an accountant. It's, um, and I'm not an accountant. I, I, I do have a finance background uh, and a legal background. Uh, I, I went to law school. But the controller is a citywide official that's really a check on the mayor and whoever the mayor is. And he has oversight uh, over all city agencies. Uh, he's in charge of signing contracts uh, for the city of New York. He's in charge of auditing uh, all the city agencies, and there are a lot of city agencies, uh, you know, and employees. It's, it's a large office. It uh, has about 760 employees, the controller's office, uh, and they have a number of different functions, it, it different divisions in the controller's office. One of the divisions, as I said, is the audit division, where you have, uh, you know, uh, accountants working in the office, uh, and you have auditors working in the office, and those auditors basically audit city agencies uh, and city contracts. And uh, one of the things I've been saying is uh, the uh, m previous controllers have not sufficiently audited uh, outside contracts of the city of New York. Uh, the city of New York has a $92 billion budget. And actually, uh, I chaired the finance committee of the city council for eight years uh, during Mayor Bloomberg's first two terms. Uh, and there I was more involved in the actual budget of the city of New York uh, and balancing that budget. And we're going to have multi-billion dollar deficits for a while. So when can I you, came can in, you, can you give us some examples of what you mean by contracts? Because right now it sounds very academic, and I'm trying to see how it's personal. What are the kind of contracts the controller um, uh, uh, handles that uh, that matter to the average New Yorker? Well, you know, um, there are city agencies, and um, there are very many city agencies that have outside. They hire outside uh, consultants. Uh, I'll give you an example: the Department of Education. Uh, you know, most of the people in your community, you know, send your kids to, uh, you know, to the yeshiva system in, in, in Crown Heights or, or other places. 
uh, so you don't deal directly with the public schools. However, uh, the public school um, budget is one of the largest budgets uh, in, in the city of New York. We have a $92 billion budget uh, and uh, a, a large percentage of that uh, is the Department of Education budget uh, for, the, for the city. And in that budget, uh, 17 billion uh, is actually um, uh, outside contracts. And of the Department of Ed, $8 billion uh, of that uh, budget uh, is, is actually outside contracts. So uh, that's something that I think are not looked into uh, sufficiently enough. And uh, we have the audit function. One of the functions uh, of the controller is to be a check on the mayor. And how do we a check on the mayor? and the mayor's agencies is through the audit function. Uh, by, by law, the um, controller has to audit every single city agency uh, once every four years, which I've been arguing is not enough. It should be done every year. And I would expand the, uh, the auditors and the audit function uh, to root out uh, you know, uh, waste, uh, to root out uh, you know, potential fraud or uh, saving money. Uh, and I would start with the outside contracting budget because that's 19% uh, of the $92 billion city budget uh, are outside contracts uh, of various agencies. You know, some of them are good contracts, but there's a lot of waste in those contracts. And a lot of those um, outside uh, contractors can be done, some of that work can be done by actual city employees. And a lot of that money could be used to hire additional teachers rather than hire uh, outside consultants you know, for the Department of Ed. So uh, that's one of the things I've been promoting. One of the things I'd like to see done in the controller's office, uh, we're a five borough city, we should be a five borough controller office. And I wanna open up an office uh, in each of the five boroughs. Right now, there's only one office in downtown Manhattan uh, near City Hall in the municipal building. Uh, there's no reason why there shouldn't be a Brooklyn office and a Queens office and a Bronx office and a Staten Island office. Uh, and uh, one of the things I would do with that office is to provide to help with uh, financial services uh, for underserved communities uh, in the in the different boroughs, uh, and also uh, deal with financial literacy, which is a problem, you know, of our with our uh, young people, uh, and also trying to help small businesses. And we all know small businesses have been devastated uh, by this pandemic. And I'm going to use those borough offices uh, to help. Uh, bring back small businesses. And okay, help. so let's stop there a second, because a lot of what you said, I was about to interrupt you and say, uh, David, it, it sounds great, but it doesn't sound personal to me. Uh, it doesn't matter at all to me. All of those things you're talking about are great, but it, I don't I don't care who does those things. Um, but, but getting to small businesses, how does a, someone in your position, let's say uh, the controller, how does a controller uh, help small businesses um, and, and even in, in terms of a community or religious community like ours, how does a controller have any influence at all, uh, on, on those kinds of things? In other words, on, on our communities, on Jewish communities, which are very, very unique, um, as many others are, but we have our own, own unique, you know, parts of it. And, and how do you help, uh, small businesses? Well, there's a couple of things that control is involved in helping small businesses by, uh, you know, helping them get, uh, you know, needed financial services, uh, needed loans, uh, certainly, um, you know, helping them, uh, you know, access programs and, 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 uh, and federal programs, state programs. Uh, and there's a lot of money that's available that people don't uh, necessarily know about. So uh, there's a lot can be done uh, with that. But uh, when I chaired the finance committee of the city council, we provided a lot of funding uh, for not-for-profits in the Orthodox Jewish community. You know, a good as Israel gets a lot of money, uh, even the Crown Heights Jewish Community Council. And, and uh, the comptroller gets, is the person who makes those determinations? No, no, that's done by the city council. Uh, but there's a, a huge delay that the controller is in charge of processing the payments. Uh, and one of the biggest complaints I got from these not for profits when I was finance chair, and we get it now even more, uh, is that it takes too long uh, for these not for profits to get paid. So they often have to lay out the money, which they don't have, uh, that, that was given to them through a, a grant from the city council or from the borough president's office. Uh, and uh, it, there's too much red tape and it takes too long for them to get paid. The controller can expedite that. The controller can cut through that red tape. Uh, and that's something that, uh, that I'm committed to do. Right. And in terms of, of schools, for example, what are some, uh, is it the same thing that in other words, that you're able to take the, 
uh, the budget and make sure the schools get it sooner? Is that what the uh, what it's what what you're able to do in that capacity? Yeah, I mean, there's there's obviously um, constitutionally uh, allowed uh, aid to yeshivas. Uh, so uh, certainly, you know, you, you, you don't get this, you know, the same kind of aid uh, that, that public schools do, but you do have get money for uh, for busing. You get money for uh, lunch and breakfast. Uh, you know, you get money for books. So there are uh, services that the government provides uh, and the uh, the controller's office can can help uh, expedite, uh, you know, the the, uh, the payment of that money. But, um, you know, the controller really is a citywide elected official uh, that that basically is a check uh, on the mayor uh, and uh, and and the mayor's agencies. And another major function, which we hadn't even got, haven't gotten into yet, uh, are the pension funds of retirees uh, from the city of New York. Uh, we have over 700,000 retirees, including my mother, who you referred to as a, was a Cuban Jewish immigrant. She came here from Cuba. Uh, actually, when she came here, uh, she only spoke Spanish and Yiddish, because those are the languages that her parents uh, spoke uh, in the home uh, in Havana, where she was, uh, where she was born. Uh, and she couldn't speak English, so she uh, she learned English here, uh, you know, uh, and uh, became, uh, you know, uh, went to CUNY and became a public uh, high school teacher. And she now has a pension from the city of New York. She's going to be 92. Uh, um, she's 91. I'm sorry. She's going to be 91 in, in April, uh, April 2nd. But she, you know, she's relying on her teacher's pension uh, that she right. had. But uh, it's the controller's job to invest the money of the uh the city pensions, you know, and there are five separate pension funds. Uh, you're not the sole trustee as the state controller is, but you uh, you have a seat on, on, at the table on each of the boards. And it's one of the largest pension systems in the country, uh, right behind, uh, you know, the state of California and the state of New York uh, and the city of New York. It's, it's probably about uh, $240 billion uh, in pension money from the five pensions uh, cumulatively. Uh, and the controller uh, has a major say uh, in those investments. And uh, right. uh, obviously uh, my fiduciary obligation is to try to get the best return and not to invest the pension fund money, uh, in my opinion, uh, you know, strictly for political purposes. Uh, Cause some of my opponents are, are saying, you know, we should do responsible investing and invest, uh, you know, uh, for, you know, political uh, issues. Uh, I don't think that should be the, primary responsibility, uh, fiduciary obligation, you know, other controllers should be to right. try to get uh, the best return uh, on I the assets. I agree with you on that one. For, for the uh, pensioners. Yeah. So, so you, you just brought up, you just segued almost into my next question, which is going to be in a presidential election. It's very easy to differentiate between the candidates. Uh, if you wanted to, to, uh, to vote for Trump or for Biden, it wasn't difficult to understand the differences between those two candidates. Um, but when it comes to controller, uh, now that we have a bit of a better understanding of what that is, could you give me some examples of, cause I don't know who the controller is now and I don't know, I don't know who your opponents are and I don't know anything about their positions. So could you tell us why, what would be the difference? What difference would you be making if you were to take over the current controller uh, and how would you be different to another controller who might be your opponent right now? What is it that makes you a compelling candidate for our community that makes a difference to us? And, and, and if we don't have you, we're not going gonna, we're gonna, to have something. Well, it's a citywide official uh, and it's a check on the mayor and whoever the mayor is. And we don't know who the next mayor is going to be. Um, you know, I've, I've been a moderate Democrat uh, my whole life. Uh, you know, I've been a mainstream uh, moderate. I've uh, been fighting the Democratic Socialist movement of late. We have a number of, uh, you know, Democratic Socialists who, uh, you know, have joined the legislature uh, and uh, been involved with the city council. Uh, there was actually a questionnaire for the citywide office, um, you know, for the Democratic Socialists. I refused to uh, participate in that process, but a lot of my colleagues and others participated in it. And they actually asked a question uh, in that questionnaire in order to uh, get their endorsement is you have to uh, basically support the BDS movement and you have to uh, pledge uh, not to take an official trip to Israel uh, while the occupation is, uh, is, is going on. And, and I, of course, you know, have been a, a strong Zionist. I've been, you know, been to Israel, you know, uh, 
you have know, your over opponents, ten, over have your current times. opponent signed that? Uh, there's one particular one. I don't want to mention the name, but, uh, you know, who's, who's basically, uh, you know, basically more involved with the democratic socialists. I, I don't know whether he, you know, signed that pledge or not, but, uh, but certainly is talking, you know, like a democratic socialist. And, uh, that's, that's not me. The other thing is almost all my opponents, uh, have been supporting the defund the police movement. Uh, and even though that's not directly, uh, relevant, uh, to the controller's office, uh, it is relevant as a citywide official uh, and someone, uh, you know, that has the, uh, you know, decides, signs off on the budget, uh, that uh, all these, uh, this movement to cut the police budget is very dangerous in my opinion, because we've already seen a spike uh, in gun violence in, in many neighborhoods and, uh, and crime creeping up. Uh, and I think that's because of uh, the cut that the city council did uh, to the police budget. And they're talking about cutting it even more and, uh, you know, just from my experience in my eight years uh, in the city council, I think that's a big mistake. We actually added police headcount uh, when I was in the city council. Uh, I think it's, it's, we need more police, not less. Uh, you know, I, I, I support, you know, police reform like everybody how do, else. How does the comptroller uh, have an influence on how many uh, police officers they are or whether they will be funded or not? Isn't, isn't that the... Uh mayor's job how do you you can't just say no to the mayor can you or, or can you, you can you can you're a check on the mayor you have uh you know um you know audit authority uh, over the mayor's agencies as i mentioned a few times uh and you're you know you're a check on the mayor you 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 sign contracts you can object to signing certain contracts for whatever reason uh and you can you can audit them um but uh you know there there are um you know, political positions people are taking as a citywide elected official and you have a bully pulpit. You're one of three citywide officials uh, that it represent the entire city. You have the mayor, you have the controller, and you have the public advocate, which is a citywide uh, official. Uh, so you have that bully pulpit. But I've been one of the, uh, the only ones actually, you know, advocating uh, for more police uh, and better uh, community policing. Uh, you know, there could always be uh, changes, but uh, I don't think we should... Uh, you know, be cutting police because of, uh, you know, issues that occurred mostly in other states. Uh, and we have probably one of the finest uh, police departments in the country. Uh, and uh, most of the abuses have not been with the NYPD. They've been with, you know, police departments in, in other cities. And uh, people, you know, have becoming, you know, are scapegoating, you know, our NYPD. And, and I think that's a shame. It's, uh, you know, it. it it's, a, it's in some ways it's becoming a thankless job. You know, people, you know, they, they were heroes during 9-11. They were heroes during the pandemic. Uh, and now is not the time to vilify, you know, our police and our, our front, you know, frontline workers. And, uh, you know, uh, so right. I, I'm not part of that defund the police. I'd like to, uh, to see, uh, you know, changes, more community policing, more involvement with the community, uh, maybe more mental health training for people but not the answer to, uh, to cut back, uh, you know, uh, on, on police, which could jeopardize public safety. Right. That's interesting. So, so I was surprised to hear one of the things you just said is that part of the, that the police budget has already been uh, slashed a little bit. Um, Over a billion dollars. Out of how much? I think probably out of uh, 4 billion or 5 billion. So that's a substantial 15, 20% hit. So, right. Uh, and, and that's already gone into effect? It went into effect with the last budget, although some people are saying uh, one of my opponents, for example, uh, voted against the budget because he said it didn't really cut the police department by a billion. It just transferred, you know, uh, you know, police, some police into uh, the public schools instead of being a part of the police budget. So it kind of moved things around. But there were elimination of two classes. So they actually you can't argue with that. Uh, we got rid of uh, two police classes, so we, we got rid of uh, a couple of thousand police officers by not uh, having those two classes. And a lot of people have retired since then, uh, and we haven't you know, replaced those police officers. So we've definitely already reduced police headcount, and I think that's already having an effect. Right. Yeah, because I, I think that everyone would agree that there's room for improvement uh, in the police force. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean to cut it down. That's not not necessarily the way to do it. Um, so now I wanted to circle back to the 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 how we started the dis discussion, uh, where you were talking about your familiarity 
um, with the the from the Orthodox Shema Shabbos community. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think are the issues, the political issues that um, are most relevant and pertinent to voters uh, in the religious communities? Well, look, I've been, you know, uh, a proponent of religious freedom and, and fighting uh, for the rights, uh, you know, of all religions. Uh, one of the bills I'm most proud of uh, in the legislature uh, that I sponsored uh, was uh, called the Religious Car Bill. And the governor signed it into law about a year and a half ago. It's now the law of the state, uh, which prohibits discrimination in all employment, uh, public or private, uh, for wearing religious garb or facial hair for religious reasons. And that would obviously, uh, you know, affect Hasidic Jews with beards, uh, with hats, uh, with yarmulkes. Uh, and it also it doesn't just affect the Orthodox Jewish community; sure. it affects the Muslim community with uh, Muslim women, uh, you know, covering their hair and uh, wearing hijabs. It affects uh, the Sikh community uh, who wear uh, turbans uh, and long beards. And no one should have to choose between observing their religion the way they uh, feel is the right way to observe it uh, and their employment and supporting their families. And that's something I've been fighting for. And of course, we all know that uh, there are some countries that don't allow uh, religious freedom. And uh, it's kind of hard to believe that uh, in, in, in New York State, in New York City, uh, you know, uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, it was legal to discriminate uh, against people uh, for wearing uh, religious garb or facial hair for religious reasons. And actually, one of the things that prompted that bill, in addition to, you know, knowing, you know, the Hasidic communities, I have a large Sikh population in my district. I represent Richmond Hill, which is like the, uh, the Sikh capital uh, of New York City. Uh, they have a Sikh temple in uh, in Richmond Hill that has uh, nine thousand members, wow. uh, and um, almost they like seven seventy, <laughs> like seven seventy, <laughs> right? And and they were discriminated against, uh, you know, in in employment. And uh, there was a, a train operator uh, who was a convert to Sikhism. He was originally an Irish Catholic, Kevin Harrington, and he took on the name Singh, Kevin Harrington Singh. And during nine eleven, he was a hero because he drove the E-Train. And if you know the subway system and the E-Train, that went right into the World Trade Center. And he actually, on 9-11, uh, drove the E-Train backwards and forwards, picking up uh, people and you know rescuing them to safety, bringing them uh, out of the uh, Trade Center area with the fumes. Uh, and he was a hero during 9-11. And what happened is, uh, right after 9-11, uh, hundreds of people called uh, the MTA to say that there was a terrorist driving the train. And, and you know, why they say that? Because he looked like Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. He had a long beard and a turban. Uh, it was right after 9-11. And so right. what did the MTA do? Uh, this hero during 9-11, uh, they basically removed him. They fired him. They took him off uh, the front of the train. And, you know, that's that was as discrimination as you can get because it was based on, on ignorance. Right. And, uh you know, people look different. They, they're uncomfortable. It, it could apply yeah. to the Hasidic community as well. Yeah, people absolutely. aren't aren't comfortable uh, with a lot of the way a lot of Hasidic Jews look. Let me ask you this, because this is, I think, uh, a probably one the number one topic that would uh, that would get uh, religious people out of their homes on a snowy day to uh, to vote. Um, and I don't know if the controller has any control of this kind of thing, but. We're here uh, for generations. We own uh, property. We own our houses. Uh, we pay a very high property tax. And my understanding is that that goes to, uh, to public schooling, which is great. Every society must have uh, schooling for your, their children. But there's this inequity that's going on with uh, the Hasidic uh, uh, minority and religious schools. And I don't believe, I think it's also any religious schools or private schools, uh, whether it's uh, Muslim, Sikh, Catholic, whatever it is, that we have to pay uh, in full for our education. We don't get any, not even uh, not even a small uh, discount um, or vouchers for for to pay for our education. It's a basically all or nothing scenario. I I believe that it is is patently unfair. I think that the church state argument uh, to deny it is 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 just uh, is just avoiding the real issue. I think it's just politics. And I wanted to know what's uh, what would 
what is there's a control firstly what's your opinion on it as as uh, well, and secondly could do you have any uh, uh, is there anything that you could do to to uh, to influence a future mayor to at least do something uh, to alleviate the financial strain on 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 religious families and private school families uh, in their schooling well i've been a, a strong supporter of uh, not only the public schools but the yeshiva system as well and and the parochial school system whether it be Catholic schools, Muslim schools, Sikh schools, et cetera. So uh, I have been, and uh, there are constitutionally protected, you know, um, uh, money that they're entitled to. Uh, and by the way, and I say this all the time, uh, if everybody that sends their kids to yeshiva or to, uh, you know, other religious schools sent their kids to the public school, there's no way that the public schools could handle it. Uh, and uh, it would collapse the uh, the public school system. So in a lot of ways, uh, it's in the public school system's interest uh, to have, uh, you know, private schools and parochial schools thrive. And in the case of, uh, you know, parochial schools and yeshivas, it's clearly different uh, than, than private secular schools because you have a choice. Uh, and most people, my family too, you know, my, with my kids all went to yeshiva. They feel for religious reasons, you have no choice. And it's, 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 it, and it's, it is unfair that you're not you know, getting that. So I did support some legislation in Albany uh, that would uh, make a difference. Uh, I supported, uh, you know, the um, EITC, which was the edu Educational uh, Income Tax Credit, which would mean you'd get a tax credit uh, for contributions uh, to yeshiva, dollar for dollar. Uh, I supported... Um, contributions you know, enough... meaning uh, donations, or that means for, uh, for tuition? No, no, don't not not vouchers per se because there weren't really uh, you know legislation on that, but there was uh, you know something where uh, you know uh, you know a good Israel, for example, was arguing and fighting for you know the um, education um, you know income tax credit where you'd uh, you could make a contribution uh, you know uh, to yeshiva. It, it basically enabled uh, people to get tax benefits you know uh, you know for um, you know for for donating uh you know large sums of money which would help the yeshivas but there are other things we we've increased uh, mandated services uh during my entire time in the legislature uh, every year we did stem uh you know stem money to help uh you know um, yeshivas and private and parochial schools uh you know to uh, to get government money uh, for that and, and we've increased uh you know other mandated services so uh you know it's it's a balancing act but uh, I think you have to realize that uh, if everybody, uh, you know, that um, so that sends their kids to uh, yeshiva, you know, switch to public schools, they couldn't handle it. And the, uh, the public schools would be would significantly be uh, negatively affected. So uh, so, uh, you know, I think uh, neither, it's not inconsistent to support, you know, uh, dual systems and. Uh, you know, and again, as I said, I'm a product of the yeshiva system. My uh, children have been, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I think there's a lot we can do uh, to help our, uh, our religious schools. Uh, as Would well you as be willing public. to prioritize this as controller to make this an issue or? It's not really the controller's job. Uh, you know, uh, certainly uh, we could audit the Department of Ed uh, and, uh, you know, and see waste and root out some of that waste. Uh, but, um, you know, that's really, uh, that's more of um, a role of, uh, you know, you know, the mayor, the legislature, but, you know, there's still cases that have, have been established. But I, um, again, I've been a, a fighter for religious freedom. Even uh, I chair the corrections committee uh, in the assembly. Uh, and I've worked uh, very closely, uh, you know, with a number of uh, Orthodox Jewish, uh, you know, prison advocacy uh, groups. Uh, actually, that uh, you know that the uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe was involved in in in, in, find, in you know founding. Uh, we have um, you know a number of these uh, these groups. You have uh, the Aleph uh, Society, which fights for uh, to help uh, you know Jewish inmates and provide uh, you know uh, you know books and, and and kosher food and and, and services. Uh, and since I'm chair of the Corrections Committee, I've worked with all the the chaplains throughout the city and, and, and fighting, uh, you know, to get, you know, religious services, uh, you know, and, and, you know, provisions, uh, you know, whether they be classes, uh, as recently as Purim because of the, you know, COVID-19, uh, you know, the, uh, 
Chabad Shluchim uh, generally uh, read the Megillah in, in correctional facilities all over the state. Uh, and I was dealing with uh, Rabbi Shmuel Butman. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I actually sponsor, I have Rabbi Shmuel Butman comes up to uh, Albany every year and I sponsor him and, and have a resolution uh, for the Rebbe's birthday. It's always uh, around, coming up actually, uh, before Pesach. And uh, we, uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to have the full ceremony uh, last year because of COVID-19. And I'm afraid it's going to be the same thing this year. I'm hoping, you know, uh, soon it'll change. But, uh, you know, I've been been very involved, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, with the religious community and uh, in Chabad in particular, you know, in, uh, you know, this resolution every year that I, I, I sponsor uh, to uh, have uh, X number of days of education uh, in the state of New York, uh, you know, based on the, the years of uh, what the Rebbe would have been in age. Uh, it's probably, it's already probably Bay of Esrim. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think it's time to start wrapping up. So I guess um, one of the you know, we've heard a lot. We've heard a lot from you. We've we've gone. Uh, we've talked about the role of the controller. We've talked about the difference between you and and some of your uh, opponents, for example. Uh, some of the ways you can help small businesses and schools, etc. In a nutshell, could you give us a a because I see that you're a very enthusiastic uh, politician and that you like to give a lot of detail. L- keeping it short. Uh, and keeping it right to the point, why should we vote for you? Well, you know, I really feel of all the candidates running, um, you know, controller is a job that I'm, I'm well suited to. I have the, uh, the real relevant uh, finance experience, public and private, by the way, uh, in addition to chairing the finance committee, of the city council during uh, two of the most difficult times in the history of the city of New York, uh, the uh, post 9-11 fiscal crisis, and the uh, 2008 uh, recession. I also was deputy superintendent of banking for New York State for four years uh, under Governor Mario Cuomo. And I had a 25 year uh, Wall Street career with major firms uh, in municipal finance, which is another major function of the controller's office. The controller is in charge of the uh, long-term bond issues uh, that build the capital projects uh, of the city of New York, whether they be uh, you know, schools or hospitals, uh, or roads or uh, bridges, uh, you know, and, um, you know, that's a major function uh, of the controller's office. And I have that relevant experience. I'm not using uh, the controller's office as a springboard for higher office or to run for mayor. Uh, I want to be controller because I really think I can make a contribution uh, during what's going to be one of the toughest times uh, in the history of the city of New York. We're going to be in this fiscal crisis for a number of years. Uh, I want to contribute to bringing back the economy, to bringing back small businesses. Uh, and I think I have uh, the relevant experience uh, to do that. Incredible. So that's that's interesting because I was wondering, why why do you want to do this? Is this a... a uh, uh, so you're saying it's not a stepping stone. We're not going to see a, a, a mayoral uh, <laughs> a candidate one day, David Reprin for mayor of New York City. I don't expect that, but I, I, I would love to make a major contribution uh, as controller for eight years. Let me tell you something. If you were to, uh, if you were to go for mayor, I, I think you've made a convincing case. <laughs> we would, we would, that would be that would be great. Um, so let me see if we have some questions that have come in. Um, How are okay. we doing time wise? We're we're doing great. We have uh, we, it's question time. Okay. <laughs> so Avi, please send me some uh, some questions. Um, Avi's in the background over here, who's been running this in the back. Um, Okay, well, someone's just asked a, a really basic question. When is the election? <laughs> when and where is this election? I don't, I, that's a question I should have it's, asked. It's, um, it's actually a June Democratic primary. You have to be a registered Democrat, uh, even though you still have to run in November if you win the Democratic primary. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a Republican in this race. It's really going to be decided in the Democratic primary. I think you can say the same thing for the mayor. There are a lot of candidates for mayor. Uh, so you may want to look at some of those candidates, but it's going to be a June 22nd uh, Democratic primary. And uh, we, we just started March, so it's really not so far away. It's only another uh, three and a half months. 
And um, how do you how do you register to be a Democrat? And, and what if you don't what if you don't you're not a Democrat? Well, you can't vote in the primary. You can still vote in the general election, but I don't think there'll be a choice at that point. You know, I think whoever wins the Democratic primary uh, will be the next controller and will be the next mayor. Uh, you still have time to uh, to register uh, as a Democrat. Uh, I would, uh, you know, call the Board of Elections. You can do it online. You can certainly do it online. But, uh, you know, I think it's important. Uh, and I, I think uh, most of the uh, Crown Heights uh, Jewish community uh, are registered Democrats just because there have been so many issues, you know, going back to some of the things that have occurred. And I think uh, the Hasidic community is very, um, you know, uh, attuned and, and sophisticated uh, as far as uh, the operations uh, of New York City. And they realize that in order to make a, a difference, you know, in, in who our uh, citywide officials, who our local officials are going to be, uh, it's often the Democratic primary that will decide it, whether it be you know, your local Congress member, your local state assembly member, your local uh, city council member, your local state senator. Those are all going to be decided in New York City uh, in the Democratic primary. So it's, uh, I think it's a district attorney. Uh, I think it's important, the borough president. So I think it's important, uh, you know, that uh, you, in order to really have a say in New York City, you can still vote for whoever you want, uh, for president, for governor. Uh, and even for mayor at one point, but uh, but I think it's really the primary is really going to make a big difference at the local level, and you're really giving up uh, that vote uh, if you're not registered, uh, you know, as as a Democrat in the city. Right. Interesting. Okay. So I think we basically covered everything. Uh, do you have any final uh, final sell final remarks uh, that you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, just that, um, you know, again, uh, it's important, uh, you know, that the controller, uh, you know, um, in, in a lot of ways, be a fiscal conservative, a, a lot of ways, uh, you know, uh, safeguard uh, the city pension system, pension funds, uh, and the retirees, the 700,000 uh, plus retirees, uh, like, like my 90 year old mother, uh, like, uh, you know, former uh, police, former firefighters, teachers, uh, civil servants, DC 37 employees, and other employees of the city of New York. A lot of people go into uh, to civil service and into government uh, because of the benefits and the pension. Uh, you know, they don't, they don't get paid as much as the private sector, uh, but uh, they go into these fields because of the benefits. Uh, and the pensions are very important, and they don't want, you know, th those pensions compromised. So I think it's important uh, to keep the system. And uh, if, if the pension funds don't uh, reach the returns uh, that are, are pre-guaranteed, it's up to the city of New York through their budget to make up the difference. Uh, and that could uh, bring the city into uh, even further fiscal crisis. So, uh, so right. I'm committed to uh, protecting the pension funds, getting the best uh, returns on the assets, uh, and using uh, the audit function uh, to audit uh, outside contracts of the city, as well as uh, regular city agencies uh, to deal with uh, some of the waste uh, in government uh, and, and save money. Amazing. I think you've done a, an incredible job in, uh, in presenting your, your case and your, uh, and your qualifications and what you'd be doing. We wish you a lot of good luck. Um, definitely, I've learned a lot, and I think that everybody uh, watching has. Um, and I think that's basically a wrap, but I do have a, a personal question. I'm just curious about nothing to do with politics. Sure. And that is you've been in Brooklyn for all these years. I'm curious. Did you ever meet the Lubavitcher ever? Many times I've gotten many dollars, uh, over the years. I'm in Queens. I'm not in Brooklyn, but, uh, you know, I, I, I used to go to Fabrengan's, uh, as a, as a young, uh, as a teenager, uh, I used to go to Crown Heights for Shabbos a lot. Uh, how and, did that happen? Who did, who, how did you, I was close to a lot of Chabad rabbis, uh, you know, uh, in, in, you know, in my area and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, through college and, uh, and, uh, through the hex, you know, I was involved with the, uh, with the national committee. So, uh, I've spent, uh, many Shabbosim, uh, in Crown Heights, uh, and gone to many Fabrengans, uh, and, uh, you know, the, I'm very close to, uh, you know, uh, to the Ohel and, uh, you know, where the Rebbe is. And I've gone there and uh, my wife goes there more frequently than I do, but she does, does drag me usually. Uh, anytime there's, um, you know, some issue involving our children or grandchildren, 
she will always, uh, you know, go to the Ohel, go to the uh, Rebbe's grave. Uh, Is and, there anything uh, ever that that you heard out of her bringing from the Rebbe, or that you, that an experience you had uh, by dollars, which was uh, which was a which was something worth remembering, something that uh, had an impact on you, or something that you carry with you? Um, anything that you ever heard out of her or or any, anything that just curious? The, 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 you could say that there was nothing, but I'm just wondering. No, no, I, I remember, um, you know, the Rebbe saying, uh, you know, to many people, um, you know, uh, it doesn't matter uh, whether a Jew is religious or not. Uh, we still have to uh, bring them closer to Judaism. And, um, you know, and, 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 you know, all Jews, we, uh, you know, are, are our brothers and sisters. And uh, he was non-judgmental. And, and I think the Chabad movement in general uh, throughout the world uh, is non-judgmental. And they try to bring uh, Jews uh, closer to, to Judaism, closer to Hashem. Uh, and there's no such thing as uh, if you don't observe one thing, you can't observe something else. Whatever you observe uh, is, is a positive thing. And I, I think that was the message that the Rebbe uh, gave. And, and I had heard, you know, through translation, because uh, I'm not fluent in Yiddish, um, although I'm, I am fluent in Hebrew. I did, you know, learn that in, in, in the yeshivas I went to. Uh, but... Um, you know, I think the message is, you know, that, uh, you know, all Jews, um, you know, uh, you know, should be brought closer to Judaism, closer to God, closer uh, to religion. And uh, and right. it's not it's not for us to judge uh, who's a good Jew and who's so not. Since a good you're Jew. since you're going for public office in New York, uh, I, I feel and maybe you know about this. Maybe you haven't. And I'll ask Avi to send it to you. Um, but but it's it's a lot broader than that, because Mayor Dinkins. Uh, who was not popular in the Jewish community, uh, as especially in, in Crown Heights but after the riots. But he came to the Rebbe after the riots, and this is all on video. And um, he met the Rebbe, and he said something to the effect, and I'm, I hope I don't misquote, but he said something to the effect, uh, wishing that, uh, that God will help to bring the two communities, the Black and the Jewish community, together. And the Rebbe corrected him and says, uh, it's, not, it's not two peoples, it's one people under one God. And, uh, and although the questions I've asked over here have been more pertinent to the Jewish community, uh, we, uh, we obviously want everybody to do well. The, the Jewish communities, the black communities, the, the white communities, everybody uh, in New York City deserves to uh, have a good controller, have a good mayor, and it be successful and have everything good and all God's blessings. So again, thank you so much, Mr. David. And uh, we wish you a lot of good luck and thank you for spending the time with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you uh, for participating in this. And uh, are you going to play something for us? Are you going to? Uh... <laughs> you, you I know you're a musician. Uh... <laughs> that wasn't part of this contract. I'll oh, have to okay. talk to my controller to see if we can release some funds for this. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, thank you very much. Thank you.